Cantor is a guy that I met five years ago when we did a program in Cincinnati, and it was it was a funny thing. Before I get into reading his his uh, his introduction, but we did this program out in L.A. and we were video excuse me in Cincinnati, and we were video recording, and I had only heard about him and that he's a really great speaker, and. We, he gets up on the stage, and first off, he doesn't just get up on the stage. He runs up on the stage, and it's like he's got to say good morning or good evening to everybody. And just the audience wasn't loud enough for him. So he had to get down, run to the back of the room, come running all the way back up again, show all of his energy, jump up on the stage, scream out again good evening, and he got them all to respond to him. But I didn't know that this guy liked to run around the room doing his programs, all right? And so... I'm used to just the people being up here on the stage or behind the podium or whatnot. And the program begins, and what does this guy do? He takes the microphone and he starts running around the room to go around the back of all the patients and their caregivers, all right? And the cameras, not knowing that they're not supposed to follow him, chase him around the room, showing everybody's faces, and I'm screaming out, no. <laughs> all right, so that guy has been great and let me introduce him. Aaron Boster, MD, is a board-certified clinical neuroimmunologist specializing in multiple sclerosis. He currently serves as the system's medical chief of neuroimmunology and the director of the MS Center at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. As a neuroimmunologist, Dr. Boster provides diagnosis and treatment of all types of multiple sclerosis, as well as a wide range of neuroimmunological conditions. Dr. Boster, knew he wanted to become an MS specialist since he was 12 years old, growing up with, uncle, with his uncle, diagnosed with the disease. This personal connection and experience inspired him to treat MS patients and their families differently. His relentless focus on not just patients, but also their families, means they receive individualized and longitudinal care. He's got to use these big words on me. When he is not treating the patients, Dr. Bostler enjoys spending time with his wife and two children, weightlifting, playing chess. He's also a self-proclaimed foodie. And let's welcome Dr. Aaron Bostler as he runs up here and jumps up on the stage because that's what he's going to do, right? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, man. Tony! I'll use the mic in a second. Camera five, good. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am super excited to be here for a couple reasons. For example, you guys have something that we don't have back in Ohio right now, sun. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I, I, I want to just begin by thanking MS Views and News. Not for having me here today, I am grateful for that, but for the service that they provide to our MS community, our global MS community. I can't find a parallel organization that provides this level of information to, disseminated to this amount of people anywhere in the universe. So can we give a round of applause to MSV News? <laughs> if you are a plant from the American FDA, this is my rap sheet, so I'm in compliance. What is MS? What is multiple sclerosis? In order to understand multiple sclerosis, we must first start by taking a step backwards and thinking about the immune system. The immune system are a bunch of little white blood cells made inside the bone marrow of our bones. And when they leave the bone marrow, they go to school up in the thymus, which I like to call T-cell university. Now, T-cell university is a very unusual college. First of all, it's completely free. We don't have those in Ohio. Also, there's only one class at T-Cell University. The only class available is, can you differentiate self versus non-self? If I show you a cell, do you know if it belongs to you or a virus and bacteria? That's the, that's the only class. When you graduate from T-Cell University, there's only one occupation available, and that's soldier. And so all the graduates are given weapons, and they're sent out into the human body to tool around and they check all the cells out. And when they see one of themselves, they say, hey man, it's nice to see me. How am I doing today? And they give themselves a high five. Then when they see a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, a foreign invader, they stop what they're doing. They get out their iPhone 7 
or if you're my wife, an iPhone 7 Plus, which is the size of a textbook, and they take a picture of the virus, the foreign invader, and they keep that picture, that memory, for the lifetime of the human being. Then they call all their friends over and they stop the foreign invader to death. The next time that foreign invader enters the body, the immune system is ready and waiting because it kept that Polaroid memory of the virus. And so when people tell you that you can't get chicken pox twice, they lied. You can have chicken pox a hundred times. The second time you have chicken pox, your immune system is so excited because it's been waiting since you were eight years old to do something and it jumps all over the chicken pox and you don't manifest symptoms. But hold on, let's go back to T-Cell University. What happens if you fail the class at T-Cell University? Remember how I told you it's a very unusual school? They take you out back and shoot you. So that's kind of the downside. You know, it's free to get in, but if you do poorly, it doesn't work out very well. Only cells that can differentiate self versus non-self are allowed to live. Theoretically speaking, you should have no cells that can't do that. Unfortunately, there are times where our immune systems make an error in judgment. There's a mistake made, and one of the cells at T-Cell University fails the class, and they don't kill him. They graduate him. So he gets some weapons, and, and he's a soldier just like all of his buddies, and he goes out with all of his friends, and he does what he thought he was taught to do, and he tools around the human body. He sees a self-cell and mistakes it for a foreign invader. He does what he was taught in school. He takes a picture of it, he calls his friends over, he stomps on it. And every single time one of those cells sees that, it thinks it's an invader and attacks it. The problem is that is actually part of you. That's called autoimmunity, friendly fire. I asked my stepbrother, who's a United States Marine, and he confirmed, you're not supposed to shoot your buddy on guard duty. And that's really what's happening in the setting of autoimmunity. Now, if the autoimmune reaction occurs in the pancreas, what do we call that? <laughs> Diabetes, that's exactly right. And if it occurs in the joint, what do we call that? <laughs> Rheumatoid arthritis, you guys are awesome. I'm just gonna take a break and you can keep going. Now, what happens if the immune attack occurs in the holiest of holy, the supercomputer that runs the entire body, the brain, or the spinal cord, the superhighway that takes all that information from the brain down to the toes and back up, what do we call that disease? Yeah, that's multiple sclerosis. Now, we can think of MS several different ways. For a moment, I want us to think about it as potholes. Now, in Ohio, we have two seasons. We have winter in construction. And during construction, we fix all the potholes that occurred during the winter. Now, do you have potholes in Florida? Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. I thought maybe it was like an Ohio thing. So, how many of you, show of hands, have done the following? You're driving on the freeway, you see a pothole, stop your car, get out of your car, take a picture of the pothole, call the city and say, hey, I want to report a pothole here, and then you wait for the pothole to be filled. Raise, show of hands. You know, nobody ever does that in Ohio either. What do we do when we see a pothole? We just drive around it, right? We're eating a sandwich, talking on the cell phone, driving 80 miles an hour, and we see a pothole, and we just go, we don't even think about it. MS makes potholes in your brain. MS causes focal areas of damage like a pothole, and your brain will ignore it if it can. It'll go around it just like your car if it's able to. So there are times when there's no work around. If there's a pothole and your car can't get around it, you, got, you, you might be stuck. There's parts of the brain and spinal cord like that, like the optic nerve. You don't have two of them on the left side, just one. And if you have a, an MS lesion there, you're not gonna see very well. But there's many, many other parts of the brain and spinal cord where it's not so straightforward. And that leads me to comment on the invisible nature of multiple sclerosis. So much of the pathology of MS is invisible to the casual observer. This is a major frustration for everyone involved in MS because you can't see it. And I wanna highlight some of the invisible nature of this disease process by sharing with you a really powerful survey that was done they asked 1,000 people with MS and a bunch of care partners 
a bunch of questions. And what they learned about the underbelly, the invisibleness of MS, is daunting. Half of people with MS reported that depression and anxiety limited their ability to do things. Two-thirds of people said that those around them didn't know they had MS because, honey, you look so good. You ever heard that before? But honey, you look so good. <gasps> you don't look like you're sick. Well, you don't look like you're dumb. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. So, so half, of, half of people that responded, half of people said they couldn't do their housework because of fatigue. Now, now think with me, please. Many people judge the value that they bring to their household by the cleanliness of their home. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. Imagine that your spouse goes off to work and you're at home and your task is to clean the house. And you are so profoundly fatigued, you can't? Imagine how that feels. And your spouse comes home and says, honey, what have you done all day? I, try, I just tried to get, I, I think that is, is so terribly telling about the invisible nature of this condition. The, the last one is that a third of respondents determine whether or not they went out of the house on any given day based on their bladder. Wow. Wow. I would now like to share with you a, a way of understanding MS that I find awesome. It's called the leaky pool model of multiple sclerosis. Anybody heard of the leaky pool model of MS? Show of hands. Well, I am super excited that I get to talk to you about it today. I did not invent this. I take no credit for its construction or conception. A good friend of mine, a really awesome neurologist named Stephen Krieger, who's at Mount Sinai in New York, he made this. But I am a I am an alkalite of it, I adore it, and I'm really excited to share it with you. This is a model of multiple sclerosis that I share with almost all of my patients when I'm in clinic with them, because I think it helps us understand the disease. So, so look at the board, if you will, and what I'm showing you, that graphic, is intended to be a swimming pool in cross-section. And let's see if this pointer works. So here you have the water level of the swimming pool. This is the shallow end and this is the deep end, right? And that's the floor of the swimming pool. Now, the, this surface, the surface of the water, is called the clinical threshold. What that means is things above the surface of the water, the human being's aware of. I can't see out of my left eye. My down there's don't work. My leg's numb. My hand's weak. Symptoms. Everything below the water level, inside the pool, the human being is completely unaware of. They don't know that there's something wrong. But you can see it on the MRI. Now, the amount of water in the pool represents the functional reserve. What is functional reserve? The functional reserve is your nervous system's ability to withstand an insult. Not an insult like you're ugly. I mean like I didn't sleep last night. Or I have a urinary tract infection. Something like that, that taxes the body. And the nervous system has different amounts of functional reserve in different parts of the nervous system. So, for example, the spinal cord has very little functional reserve. It can't withstand an insult very well. The top of the brain, which is shown in green on the right, there's a lot of room, a lot of functional reserve. Now, the way that we represent the nervous system is on the surface of the, of the floor here. And so I, I just alluded to the fact that the deep end, that floor is the, the top of the brain, the lobes, the hemispheres. The middle portion there represents the base of the brain, the brain stem. And on the far left, in that pink salmon color, we see the spinal cord and optic nerves in this model of MS. Now, the water level slowly lowers a little bit each year. It's leaking. But it can change from day to day based on many, many factors. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a second. So how do you represent activity? 
You guys understand that activity means a clinical attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse. It's when something bad happens to you and you can't hide it from your spouse. Or a new MRI spot. In this model, we show activity by a stalagmite sticking up from the surface of the swimming pool. Now, I would not like to swim in Stephen's pool. What we see here, those white things pushing up from the base, these are areas of activity in various parts of the nervous system. And if, like in number one, the, the activity crests the surface, it goes above the level of the water, that clinical threshold, that's an attack. You're aware of it. But if it's below the level of the water, like number two, you're not aware of it. But you can see it on the MRI as a new spot. Now, progression is eloquently explained using this model. I'm showing you here the water level, and you see that some of those spikes are under the water. Over time, as the disease progresses, what happens is the water level drops. Now, I want to show you my amazing PowerPoint skills. This was as close to a video as I could pull off. So the water level drops. Yeah, sorry. So, and, and what you see when the water level drops is that you uncover areas of old damage. Areas that weren't clinically affecting you as the water level drops, as the functional reserve drops, become affected. And that is the underpinnings of progression. Let me explain it another quick way. I don't own a firearm, but let's pretend that I had a shotgun and I blew a couple holes in that wall. Now, some bad things are going to happen to me, but let's pretend that the hotel doesn't fix it. All right, now there's a couple shotgun blasts in that wall. Well, then a couple years from now, Florida's big earthquake occurs, God forbid. Which wall in this room falls first? The one with the holes in it, right? The one with the structural damage. And in the same fashion, the areas of structural damage from those lesions on the MRI, the areas that caused an attack, wear out as the functional reserve diminishes. And that's the underpinnings of progression. The model also explains heat sensitivity. August in Florida is rough without MS. It's, it's really hot. And many of my patients in the summer times, they struggle because they get overheated and their legs give out. What's happening can be explained using this model. When they go outside, the functional reserve diminishes, the pool drains some of its water, and those old areas of damage come back out. But it's temporary. Because when you go back inside and guzzle water and you're in the air conditioning, the level rises. And so it's a very dynamic process. Thank you for letting me explain to you Stephen's leaky pool. And I hope that it helps us conceptually understand a little bit about how this disease behaves, specifically as it relates to new attacks and inflammation, activity, and progression of disease. I now want to switch topics. And I want to discuss with you disease-modifying therapies, MS drugs that slow the disease down. And I want to start by talking about the expectations of a drug. If you are on oral birth control, you have an expectation, don't you, to not get knocked up. That's why you're taking oral birth control. And, and you have to understand the expectations of the MS medicines. I, th I think that we do. I also am excited to share with you that these definitions, these concepts, these expectations have evolved over the last 10 to 20 years. And so, all right, so starting off, I want to talk about what I call traditional goals of MS therapies. Blue is clinical. Red is MRI. And we used to say things like, if you take this shot, I can decrease the number of attacks by a third. So if you are predestined to have three attacks next year, you're only going to have two. And I can make you get worse in progression of disability to a lesser extent. I can slow progression by 30%. And I can make you have less spots on your MRI. 
Now, essentially, what I felt like I was saying with the traditional goals was, hey, man, I can make you get worse slower. There is no pride in my voice as I look at someone, a father, a mother, a sister of someone, and say, I can make you get worse slower. That is not my goal in treating multiple sclerosis. And I don't want it to be your goal. I don't want that to be your expectation. Those are no longer the expectations of these drugs. We now have moved past that. And we now can ask different questions. Instead of saying, can we have a third less attacks, how about no attacks? Oh, I'm sorry, I expected an amen. amen. How about no disability progression? Amen. How about no new spots on your MRI? Amen. The expectation, the goal of no evidence of disease activity is today. Now, I'm not standing up here and saying for a limited time only for $9.99, if you sign up now, I can guarantee you Netta. I am not saying that. I'm saying that's the goal of the therapy. That's what we should ask for, and that's what we should, uh, should assess the success of the therapy against. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Now, it gets even better because we have started to move beyond that. Evolving goals. There are now powerful MS therapeutics that can bring to the table confirmed disability improvement. Oh my goodness gracious, to stand up on stage and talk to you about confirmed disability improvement. I never ever thought that I would get to do that. And I do today, right now, because we have MS medicines that demonstrate that people get better. Their neurological examination can improve for periods of time. I also think in the MRI world that we're now starting to ask questions about the speed of shrinkage of the brain. And so I want to spend a few minutes talking about these new modern outcome measures. No attacks, no new MRI spots, and no change on neuro exam, so much win. I love Picard, by the way. <laughs> Netta. I like Netta a lot but I'm afraid that most MS doctors don't understand it properly. And they say things like, NETA doesn't occur for very long or for very many people or, or it doesn't work very well, and, and they think about it as a yes-no. You either have it or you don't have it. That's not the right way to think about NETA. I want us to conceptually think about this, like the, the sign in my father's factory, days since last accident. And if you had a day with no accident, they flip a, a little f sign over, and now there's one day, two days, 10 days, 100 days, no accident, hoorah! And then there's an accident. My father didn't close the factory. He did a root cause analysis, he figured out what's wrong, he made a change, and then he started it over at zero. Did you guys know that if you can achieve NETA for one year, you've got a 73% chance that your neurological examination stays exactly the same for seven years? Did you know that if you can hold NETA for two years, data suggests that we can have stability seven years later, almost at 80, 85%? This is a pow yeah, that's right. This is a powerful, powerful tool, prognostically. Who knows what this is? This is the EDSS, the Expanded Disability Status Scale. This is the scale that the FDA makes us use to assess disability in a human with MS. According to the scale, zero is, I can't find nothing wrong with you on exam. Six is, I need a cane to walk. And nine is, I, I can't roll over in bed. Now, this is a graphic that I stole, like all of my images, from the interwebs. And I picked this one specifically because this has a directionality to it, doesn't it? The way this is drawn makes an assumption that the only option is to go down the down escalator. Because up until very recently, that's all we could do. No longer. We now go up the down escalator. Yeah. Woohoo! Yes, we do. We have seen therapies now 
where s small percentages of patients improve their neurological status and they go from a five to a four. Now, they may not stay that way the rest of their lives. They may only do that for six months, but golly gee, I'll take it. Confirmed disability improvement is something that we should be talking to our MS clinicians about. And this is something that we should be asking for. And we now have some therapies that are starting to demonstrate they can do this. NEP. Anybody here ever heard of NEP? NEP. I didn't make up the term NEP, but I kind of like saying it. Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. NEP. <laughs> that was kind of fun. So NEP is a new outcome measure in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. In primary progressive multiple sclerosis, NEP means no evidence of progression. For a three-month period, we can see people who have PPMS, their walking doesn't slow down, their neurologic exam doesn't change, and their peg speed doesn't worsen. They have no evidence of progression for a period of three months. And we now have an, a therapy that can double the likelihood of achieving that in people. Really very, very cool. A new expectation as we treat primary progressive multiple sclerosis. The last expectation I want to talk about is brain volume. And Bill's going to hit this button for me. Now, a friend of mine, Elizabeth Fisher, was nice enough to lend this video to me. And this is a video of a young gentleman that refused to start a disease-modifying therapy. And this is his brain volume over seven years. Now, you don't need to go to doctor school to recognize that that's bad for you. Brain shrinkage is something that our brains are supposed to do. Anybody here under the age of 18? Well, I have something horrible to share with everyone else in the room. All of our brains are shrinking. After the age of 18, it's, it's planned. Just like your, your skin gets thinner, your brain shrinks over time. But untreated MS, it can shrink upwards of 10 times faster than it's supposed to. That's a really big deal. It's the leading correlate to disability progression. And we now have some MS medicines that can slow this down. We have some MS medicines that looks like it can normalize the brain volumes. And again, this is a new expectation of our medicines that we should demand from our therapies. Really cool stuff. Slowing down brain atrophy. Whoops. Oh, I ruined it. You saw my, my, my fun slides. So, I'm now going to shift gears and talk to you about how every single MS medicine works, and I'm going to do it only using pictures. But I first want to explain in general picture how this MS medicine thing works. If you will, imagine that the line here is the blood-brain barrier. Now, because it's hard to see a line, I need a volunteer from the audience, and you've got to be quick. So yeah, come, come up here if you would. This is the blood-brain barrier. Let's give the blood-brain barrier a round of applause. Now. Please lay down on the floor. Yeah, right, no, I'm serious, we're right there. Yeah, you're the blood-brain barrier. All right, so on one side of the blood-brain barrier is the blood. And over here we have the naughty autoreactive cells. They have to cross over the blood-brain barrier into the brain. This, this over here is the brain where the cell attacks the brain. So again, the naughty autoreactive cells are over here in the bloodstream and they cross the blood-brain barrier where they gain access to the brain and they beat it up through inflammation. Every MS therapeutic that we have does something to prevent that from happening. It either retrains the cell over here, or it kills the cell over here, or it blocks the cell from crossing the blood-brain barrier, or it retrains or tries to kill the cell over here. Every therapy does that in some fashion. Now, Let's give our blood-brain barrier a huge round of applause. Thank you. Now, with that preamble, let's start talking about how these drugs work. In the upper right-hand corner, I've given you a little graphic to remind you that interferon products are injections. They're self-injections. And the way that the interferons work is they tighten the blood-brain barrier. So if the normal blood-brain barrier that we just saw is like the straw house in the three little pigs, if you squirt interferon on it, it becomes the stick house. It's a better house. And it makes it harder for those cells to cross over. And because they can't gain access to the brain, less bad stuff happens. Interferons. The next slide looks at glutiramer acetate. Glutiramer acetate doesn't do anything to the barrier. 
Glutyramer acetate is synthetic myelin. It's, it looks like myelin. In every day or three times a week, you show your, your immune system its target. You say, hey, immune system, see that? And then three days later, when you re-inject, you show it to him again, say, hey, remember that? We'll look at it again. And then a little bit later, you say, yeah, now look at it again, again. And the immune system quite literally becomes bored. It becomes bored. So instead of being a pro-inflammatory like these guys, these guys got drunk, then they went to the bar. They wanted to fight. But after showing again and again the immune system its target, they're no longer all that interested, and they just kind of want to order pizza and hang out at home and watch reruns. And, and that's what glutyramer acetate does to slow down MS. Abagio is the trade name for teraflutamide, and this is a pill, and I'll give you a little pill symbol up there to remind you of that. The way Abagio works is it prevents your body from being able to rapidly produce new clones, and it makes me think of stormtroopers. So if you slow down the production of stormtroopers, you don't have as many, and they can't go out and attack you as frequently. And so Abagio puts a stop on the ability to rapidly make a bunch of stormtroopers. And that's how it slows down MS, because there are less cells over here that can cross the blood-brain barrier and attack the human's brain. Fingolimod, codenamed Jelenia, is a pill that you take. And the way it works is really weird. It tricks your cells, about 80% of your white blood cells, into being trapped in your lymph nodes. I don't know if you know this, but all the white blood cells in your body, they do this thing, they go around the bloodstream, then they go through the lymphatics, then they leave the lymphatics. And what this drug does, when they enter the lymphatics, it traps them. It doesn't kill them, it sequesters them. And it reminds me of the Eagles Hotel California. You can come in anytime you want, but you can't leave unless I forget to take my Jelenia. <laughs> Dimethyl fumarate, or Tecfidera, is a pill taken twice a day. And it does something different as well. It tricks the white blood cells into thinking they're under oxidative stress, and they respond with an antioxidant cascade of lovely, which slows down multiple sclerosis. This is a very unique mechanism of action, Tecfidera. Declizumab. Now, in the upper corner, I've, I included that little Y symbol. That's actually a cartoon of an antibody, because declizumab is a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies are like keys. If you find your car key in your pocket, how many car doors does that key open? Hopefully just yours, right? It's specific for your car. Monoclonal antibodies are smart bombs that are specific to something in the body. And it's kind of like a bomb that only kills the chickens. You drop a bomb and the farm's fine, except now there's no more chickens. It's very, very specific. That's called a chicken bomb. I just made it up. But what we see here is a monoclonal antibody called declizumab, which is given by an injection once a month. And what it does is it sabotages the machinery of MS. I found this factory picture, and I think about, you know, machine A to machine B to machine C. Well, what this drug does is it breaks machine B. So the cascade stops by interfering with the machinery. It's like sabotage. Declusimab. Natalizumab, codenamed Tysabri, also does something to the blood-brain barrier. And if you think of the nascent blood-brain barrier as the straw house and the three little pigs, I told you if you squirt interferon, it becomes the stick house. What happens if you put Tysabri on it? It becomes the brick house. And now you have to sing with me, she's a brick. House. Woo, mighty, mighty. Now, so what we're dealing with here is the Great Wall of China. We create a barrier so severe that no cells can cross. They stay in the periphery and they can't enter into the central compartment with Tysabri. Alamtuzumab, codenamed Limtrata. Now, truth be told, I couldn't find a fun picture, so I just used this one. Limtrata is also a monoclonal antibody as evidenced up there in the corner. But it's not an injection, it's an infusion like Tysabri. This drug is given for five days, you wait a year for three days, and then you might not get it again unless you have new disease activity. This drug works differently than every other drug I've talked about because this drug doesn't try to prevent the cell from entering, it tries to retrain the cells forever. 
And what I mean by that is it kills the adult B and T cells, and it forces the, the baby cells to grow back nicer. Quite literally, the cells that return after you kill all the adults behave differently, and it's really, in some ways, a reboot or a reprogramming of the immune system. Alentuzumab. Ocrevus, the newest drug to join the MS armamentarium, works on B cells. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's infused twice a year. And the way that it works is fascinating. Now, I, when I think of this drug, I think about high school boys that bump into each other in, in the hallway, and they decide the best course of action is to duke it out behind B building at 3.30. Gentlemen, you remember that? And so when they show up to fight at 3.30, they show up with six of their best friends. If a young man shows up at 3.30 to duke it out without his friends, guess what he's not doing? He's not fighting. He's going home. Now, in this analogy, the fighter is the T cell that wants to attack your brain. But the B cells are the friends. With this drug, we murder all your friends. And so you have no buddies to rile you up to go in there and fight. And the T cells, eh, I don't really want to do that. That's how ocrelizumab works. I'm going to wrap up with a call to action. Look at this graph for a second. On the x-axis along the bottom is time. So as you go from left to right, I lose hair. And on the y-axis going up and down is disability. Going up, you get worse. And what you see in black is an untreated MS patient over time. Then what you see is if you start a disease-modifying therapy, you can adjust it so over time, the human accrues less disability. But let's push the envelope. Let's use a highly effective medicine as early as possible, and look what happens to the curve. I really believe in my heart that we need to use high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies as early as humanly possible to give people with MS the best chance of living awesome lives without disability. If you have a birth control pill and you are taking it the way you're supposed to and you get pregnant, it didn't work. And if you're taking a disease-modifying therapy and you have new spots on your MRI, it didn't work. So why on God's earth would you remain on that therapy? Or why would you not at least discuss switching to something else? I want you to ask yourself in the quiet of your heart, have you participated in therapeutic inertia? Therapeutic inertia is a situation where we identify a need for change and we don't. And I implore you to demand of your clinician, hey, buddy, I'm doing the thing that you told me to do and I had an attack and it's the second one I've had in two years. I don't want to stay on this therapy any longer. Because undertreated MS is a lot like untreated MS, in my opinion. Now, I think it's relevant to talk about when you got to dump your drug. We do not marry our MS therapies. We date them. And as long as he's a gentleman and a good dancer and a nice kisser and he goes to church and he's good with the family, well, we'll keep seeing him. But if he starts to misbehave, comes home drunk, is impolite, maybe steps out and spends some time with someone else, we're not going to put up with that. And we're going to have to tell that drug that you're going through some personal things, and it's not him, it's you, and you need some space, and that you'll call him soon, and then you got to delete him out of Facebook and, and take him out of your phone and never, ever call him ever again. So when do you need to dump your drug? Whoops. If you're on an MS medicine and you have an attack, if you're on an MS medicine and you fail the litmus test of life, you have to remove activities. If you're on an MS medicine and you have new spots on your MRI or you worsen in your disease, if you're on an MS medicine and you are uncomfortable with the safety profile or the side effects, that is rationale to have a discussion with your provider about changing therapies. Final thoughts. 
I want the people in this room to be four for four. Four for four in your fight against MS. Number one, don't smoke. Smoking cigarettes speeds up MS by about 50%. Stopping smoking speeds it back down. I didn't do that. The second thing is to be physically active. We just heard a beautiful lecture just before I got on stage about the benefits of exercise. The third thing is to supplement your vitamin D because levels lower than 50 drive the disease faster, but higher levels seem to slow it down. And lastly, take a disease-modifying therapy and make sure it's working. In the final moments on stage, I want to leave you with this thought. I want you to conceptually think of multiple sclerosis as an unwanted passenger in your car. I wish to God I could cure the disease. I don't know how yet. I can't get the disease out of your car. So you have to make an important life decision. Who drives your car? Does MS drive your car? Because if you allow MS to drive your car, you won't like where it takes you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to drive with MS in your car to a big box store. I'm a Lowe's guy myself. If you like Home Depot, I don't stand in judgment of that. But I want you to go to your big box store and I want you to pick up three items. A lead pipe, a bunch of rope, and some duct tape. And then you go back to your car, open the door, take the lead pipe, beat MS silly, tie his hands behind his back, tie up his legs, gag his mouth with the duct tape, drag him in your trunk, throw him in your trunk, lock the trunk. I want you to sit in your driver's seat and I want you to turn the radio way up. My preference, Paul's Boutique, circa 1984, Beastie Boys. Play it loud and proud and I want you to drive your car. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure.